Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Jennifer Nyman. I'm with Geosyntech Consultants, and I will be moderating the webinar series today on behalf of CERTIF and ESTCP. The webinar today focuses on DOD-funded research efforts to identify reliable techniques for detailed survey of unexploded ordnance, or UXO, at shallow underwater remediation sites. So these are sites less than five meters deep. The webinar will feature two speakers from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Dr. Dana Woodruff will focus on demonstration site operation, and Dr. Joe Haxel will discuss demonstration site development and results. We are going to pause midway through the webinar to respond to questions from the audience, and then we will also end the webinar with a longer question and answer session. We have a few slides now that provide some instructions to optimize your webinar today. If you haven't done so already, please do download Zoom at the link shown here and provide it in your reg webinar registration confirmation email. If you're unable to download Zoom, you can view the slides using a compatible internet browser like Firefox, IE, or Edge, and by creating a free Zoom account. And if you're still unable to, to view the slides, if your screen freezes, for example, you can try keying control with F5 to perform a hard refresh. This slide is about audio. If you're accessing the audio through your computer and have any issues, you can click on the arrow next to the join audio button, and then you can select test speaker and microphone, and then follow the prompts as they appear on your screen. If you continue to have audio difficulties, um, you can call into the conference line at the number shown here using the required webinar ID. For difficulties overall, you can also submit a comment using the chat box in Zoom, but please use the chat box just for comments related to technical difficulties. We're going to save the Q&A option in Zoom for questions for the speakers. And in case of any continued technical difficulties, you can download a PDF of the slides from the CERTIP and ESTCP webinar webpage and then call into the conference line. We will also be live streaming the webinar on the CERTIP and ESTCP YouTube channel, which is at the link shown here. Today's broadcast is listen only. You may submit questions. You can use the Q&A box on your screen to do that. You don't have to wait until we have a question period to submit your questions. In fact, we'd like you to submit them in advance of that session if possible. And when you submit your questions, um, please do add your organizational name at the end of your question so we can identify you. With that, I would like to introduce Dr. David Bradley, who is the CERTIP and ESTCP Program Manager for Munitions Response. His career includes US Navy supported research, a laboratory directorship at the NATO Undersea Research Center in Italy, and research and academic activities at Pennsylvania State University's Applied Research Laboratory. An emeritus professor of acoustics, he is currently a University of Washington Applied Physics Laboratory staff member assigned to the CERTIP and ESTCP program office. Dr. Bradley is a fellow of the Acoustical Society and has chaired society committees and served as president. Dave, please proceed. Thanks, Jennifer, and welcome everybody. The next few slides will give a quick overview of both SCRDP and ESCCP. Uh, SCRDP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program established in 1991 by Congress. Uh, it's a combination of a partnership between DOD, the Department of Energy, and the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, the SCRDP end of it is really a scientific and technological focused program. ESCCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program, and in turn, tightly coupled with the, uh, the first program that I mentioned, uh, is really at the demonstration end of things. Uh, they are tightly coupled, and I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, next, uh, please, Jennifer. The, there are several environmental drivers for the type of work funded by the program with the underlying objective of sustaining 
DOD ranges, facilities, and operations. Uh, as you can imagine, this is a broad undertaking. It takes the form of looking at maritime sustainability, threatened and endangered species, climate impacts, unexploded ordnance, and munition constituents. The next, please. One key environmental driver is a reduction of current and future environmental liabilities. This involves addressing contamination from past practices, including impacts to groundwater, soils, and sediments, UXO, which is more the focus today, contamination, and developing management approaches for contaminants of emerging concern. A second part of this is pollution prevention with a focus on eliminating chemicals of concern or hazardous materials. Next, please. We have several main focus areas for research and demonstration at uh, in, within the SCRDP and ESDC pro program, and, and they are listed here. Uh, next, as mentioned earlier, technology transfer is a very important uh, aspect of, of the total program, and it contains a number of uh, efforts, and you see them uh, pretty much demonstrated there, but they include videos, training uh, workshops and guidance documents, as well as uh, what we're doing this morning, uh, which is the webinar. Uh, next, please. Our webinar series uh, highlights research and demonstration efforts from all of the program areas, and you see a, a near-term listing in, in the group uh, shown in this list in front of you. Uh, registration is open for webinars uh, uh, through early next year. And finally, uh, you can find additional uh, inf information about the upcoming webinars at this link. Uh, they're all archived and can be accessed. Uh, today's webinar will provide details of the testing process for, for munition detection, classification, and localization system. The challenges of the complex marine environment create what, in quotes, I would call a number of bumps in the road, which have been successfully overcome by the PNNL team. And I'm looking forward to their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. It is now my pleasure to introduce our two speakers. Dr. Dana Woodruff is a senior research scientist with PNNL's Coastal Sciences Division in SWIM, Washington. Since 2016, she has developed the CERDIP-funded Squim Bay Underwater Demonstration Site for evaluation of underwater munition remediation technologies. She currently serves as the project manager for continued operation of the test site. Dana has over 30 years of experience in coastal aquatic research with a background in coastal remote sensing, benthic habitat mapping, and water column dynamics re um, related to biological attributes. Dana received her doctoral degree in environmental science from the University of North Carolina. Dr. Joe Haxel is an earth scientist with PNNL's Coastal Sciences Division in SWIM, Washington. He has served as a principal and co-principal investigator, projects funded by CERDIP, the Office of Naval Research, DOE, NOAA, and others. He has participated in more than 50 oceanographic cruises and has authored or co-authored 50 peer review papers. Joe received his bachelor's degree in geology from the University of California, Santa Barbara, a master's degree in oceanography from Oregon State University, and his doctoral degree in marine geology from Oregon State. Okay, Dana, you'll kick us off. Please proceed. Thank you, Jennifer, for that introduction. Uh, today, Joe Haxel and I are going to talk about the development of an underwater demonstration site for the detection, classification, and localization of unexploded ordnance. So as a little bit of background, there are over 400 military installations containing underwater munitions that need removal or remediation. Underwater sites are a challenge for a variety of reasons, as Dave alluded to. Access in water is more restricted than on land, and conditions encountered in water and on the seafloor may be unknown or very dynamic. And there are additional safety concerns related to that, as you can imagine. 
Munitions may also be partially or fully buried, corroded, or biofouled. So all of these factors present challenges in terms of detection, classification, and geolocation of UXO. The ultimate goal is to cost-effectively locate, characterize, and eventually remediate and manage underwater munition sites in a variety of environmental settings and locations. ESTCP is approaching this challenge by developing controlled underwater demonstration sites, which Joe and I will talk about today, where conditions of both the environmental setting of the site and targets of interest are well characterized. These sites provide an opportunity for developers of sensor detection technologies to understand their systems in a more realistic environment and provide a means of monitoring system technology performance. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the demonstration site development aspects over the past few years of the control demonstration site in Swim Bay, which is located in coastal waters of Washington State. So we've divided this presentation into two parts. I'll speak about some of the background and development of the demonstration site, including the environmental setting, logistical considerations and timelines, and the evolution of our test site design and targets used over the past few years. We'll take a break for some questions and answers, and then Joe will speak about some of the specific day-to-day -day operations related to ground truth, target placement, and geolocation of the targets. He'll also summarize our current operations and discuss the benefits to DOD. So Squim Bay is located along the Strait of Juan de Fuca, shown here, in the northwest corner of Washington State. It's about four kilometers long by two and a half kilometers wide in dimension and is semi-enclosed so it's reasonably well protected from the elements compared to more open ocean environments. It's about an hour and a half drive west of Seattle. The Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, shown here, a Department of Energy lab, operates a marine lab at the mouth of the bay, so we're lo located close to the site. And in the upper right here, these are examples of a couple of targets we've used in Swim Bay. And we work exclusively with inert or circuit munitions, not with live munitions. And this is currently an ESTCP funded project. We transitioned from CERTIP funding this past year. So as part of our CERTIP funding, The area, sorry, excuse me. In 2016 and 17, PNNL conducted a preliminary design study summarizing information related to bathymetry, circulation, bottom type, and water properties. Based on this information, several areas were selected as potential candidate sites. We focused on areas that were primarily sand, mud, and gravel habitat in depths ranging from five to 35 meters. Eelgrass beds shown here in shallow areas less than five meters were excluded from consideration as protected habitat. And the sediments in Squim Bay are primarily of glacial origin. So the area shown in the red polygon is permitted for target placement and demonstration activities. The area is about two and a half square kilometers. It's easily accessible to our marine lab in a nearby marina located here for equipment staging and vessel berthing. The bay is located in a non-urban setting and is a shared use space with a variety of recreational opportunities, such as sailing, kayaking, fishing, crabbing, and clamming. 
It's relatively free of clutter items compared to some more urban areas. We do have intermittent crabbing activity with pots that have been set in close proximity to our test sites in this general area. And that has been a challenge in the past. So our scope of operations and responsibilities as a test site manager is fairly broad. And these were outlined in a 2018 CERTIP workshop report that's on the CERTIP ESTCP website. And these include securing permit authorizations, programmatic permits to support deployment of targets, both buried and proud, as well as operation of platforms and sensors by technology demonstrators. We collect a variety of site-specific information to support programmatic needs and system developers' demonstrations. A list of data collected during demonstrations as well as longer-term data sets is shown at the left. And I'll go over some of the data collected in later slides. Scoping and implementation of test target plans and designs are, shown, are done in collaboration with the program office. We then implement the plan using diver support for target deployment, geolocation, ground truth, and retrieval. And this is done primarily by our PNNL scientific dive team at the Marine Lab. We also provide logistic and infrastructure support for technology demonstrations as needed. There are quite a few steps involved before implementation, implementation of a demonstration can occur, as you can imagine. And what I'm showing you is a more general timeline that has evolved over the past few years. We certainly encourage early discussion of interest from system developers. And I would say at least six months in advance, preferably more. And early in the year, we're determining who will be coming to the site and deciding on a general layout for site, dem or site demonstrations. We need a fair amount of time to secure permit authorizations. First time permitting for demonstration technologies usually takes longer, up to six months, than returning technologies. And early in the summer, we're designing specific tar target layouts with the program office and we're usually placing targets in the July, August timeframe. Technology demonstrations have occurred during September and October. We typically have good weather during this time period, calm seas and little to no wind. We're usually retrieving targets in the late fall and winter months. So at this point, I'm gonna go through a few slides that show examples of some of the environmental characteristics of the bay and water property data that we've collected. So in our region, we have mixed semi-diurnal tides, meaning each day we have two low tides and two high tides that are uneven during the course of the day. And this is showing an example of the tidal cycles during two demonstrations, each a week long conducted this fall. In general, an average tidal range is about 2.4 meters with an extreme of about three and a half meters. And this is relative to mean lower low water. And this is showing monthly averages of water clarity over a multiple year time period on the left and daily water clarity around the time of the demonstrations this year. And our average Secchi depth, or the depth at which a Secchi disk ceases to be visible from the surface is about four and a half meters. But we have extremes of less than one meter with virtually zero visibility or greater than 10 meters, which we observed later in October this year. Water clarity can be somewhat variable between days, primarily due to ephemeral algal blooms or occasional sediment resuspension after storm events. And water clarity is usually better during the late fall and winter months as shown on the left. And water transparency obviously has implications for both our dive operations, as well as optical cameras that might be used at the site. 
And this is showing a few polar histogram plots of the time average speed and direction of the current at our working site from a six week time period surrounding the demonstrations this year. And this is from the upper, middle, and lower depth layers. So the take home points here are basically the current is coming from the same direction um, at all depths with slightly more current at the bottom, but overall very little current, less than a centimeter per second. Water properties. And this is showing daily water properties collected during the times of two demonstrations this fall. And temperature, water temperature in the bay can vary from about eight degrees centigrade in the winter to up to 15 or 16 in the summer, close to the surface. There can be some stratification in the upper layers, particularly in the summer months. And you can see a little bit of stratification here. Salinity doesn't vary much. It's usually ranging between 31 and 32 PSU. There isn't any significant freshwater source to impact salinity. And sound velocity is more variable near the surface. It's generally fairly stable below 10 meters. And this is certainly more relevant for acoustic operations. And we provide all of this information on a daily basis to demonstrators heading out, usually heading out in the morning to collect data before their operations. So let's look at the Swim Bay test site. As I mentioned earlier, this has been an evolving process. And in 2019, as part of a prototype demonstration, we selected two sites to work in, one sand and one mud. However, we found that the flocculent-like sediment at the mud site with literally zero visibility on many occasions, was a real challenge for the divers for both target placement and retrieval. So this particular site was abandoned. For the past several years, we have set up the test sl site slightly to the northeast of the original sand site. And this contains a combination of sand and mud. And the depth range is between 20 and 25 meters here. So if we zoom in on the site design and look at it more closely, and this is an example from this year, we have a blind site that contains targets in a 100 meter diameter circle. And the number and location of the targets is not provided to the technology demonstrators, hence the term blind site. The selection and placement of targets is designed jointly with the program office. We also have a calibration line or training site to the north, 100 meters long. And the number and geolocation of the targets here is known to the demonstrators. In fact, the target selection and placement um, is done in collaboration with the demonstrators. So if we look at a close-up of the calibration site this year, this is the target layout. And targets were placed along a baseline every five meters, offset by two meters on either side. And note this diagram is, is not to scale. We placed 19 objects, including 12 inert UXO, four metal pipes, and three clutter items, an anchor, a cement block, and a scuba tank. All objects were tethered to the baseline. And four of these objects were buried by our divers flush with the surface, and these are shown in gray. And Joe is going to talk more about the field logistic operations of target deployment later on. So if we look at the detail of the blind site, and this is the layout from 2021, not this year. Um, the red circles are in their UXO and triangles are clutter items. There were 23 inert UXO and 27 clutter items. And believe it or not, this is actually a carefully crafted design. And while it may look random, there is considerable um, thought given to diver logistics for placement, 
the technology platform and sensor attributes and distance between objects. So let's look at a few target types. And these are examples um, showing the types of targets in our inventory that we've used in demonstrations in years past, ranging from 155 millimeter howitzers down to 40 millimeter projectiles. And you can see some of the tethers that we use on the two targets here on the left. And I'm also showing a couple of the metal pipes that are used by one of the demonstration groups for training reference. And these industry standard objects or isopipes have been used extensively in land demonstrations. We use a range of clutter items from scrap metal to anchors, crab traps, scoop tanks, et cetera. Um, and a lot of these items have actually been collected by our divers um, close to the marina. So this is, this is our reality uh, in Swim Bay. The center of the bay where the um, site is, is not very cluttered at all. We use a range. Um, so the bottom image shows a selection of clutter items and targets. And note the biofouling on the two left objects, a layer of barnacles that settled during several months while these were deployed. So each target that is used at our site is inventoried, which includes assigning a unique PNNL ID number to the target, a full description, photos are taken, and notes about the origin, the length, the weight, and deployment history at our site. And additional ground truth information is collected once the targets are deployed on the seabed. And Joe will cover that information. So at this point, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of technology demonstrators that have used our site and we've provided operational support for. The University of Washington Applied Physics Lab has a towed acoustic system called the MUST. And they've utilized the site in 2019 and 20 for engineering tests. And in uh, 2021 and 22 for demonstrations at the blind site. In 2021 and 22, the Black Tusk Tetra Tech team brought their towed electromagnetic induction system, the Ultra Team of Four to our site for a training test and site demonstration. And I would have to say that both of these groups have been very willing guinea pigs and um, have been an integral part in the evolution and development of this demonstration site. So in the next section, Joe is going to provide more detail on the daily field operations and some of the technical challenges we faced. But at this point, I'm happy to answer any questions about the site, de site development or evolution of the project. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, to our audience, um, please do submit your questions at this time using the Q&A box. And we have already received a number of questions. The first one, Dana, is about permits and authorizations. Can you talk about what permits and authorizations were obtained and what the timeline looked like for the permitting process? Yeah. Um, we have a series of federal, state, and county permits and authorizations that we're required to have. Uh, in order to conduct work or conduct marine research activities in the Bay. There are actually probably 12 or 13 of them. And for the ESTCP program, we have to pay particular attention to the seabed and where targets are placed, such as not in eelgrass beds and acoustic operations um, that may affect marine mammals, fish or birds. Um, We've walked, we worked through a lot of mitigation measures early on for some of these acoustic operations. So it's relatively straightforward now, um, but any new technology goes through an internal review process and may take longer. 
So as I said earlier, I, I believe the six month timeline is, is a really good target um, for people to shoot for. And more time is, is wonderful if we know a year in advance, generally what type of technology we can start exploring, um, what some of the hurdles may be. Excellent, thanks for the information. Um, and the question was from the Navy, and they in particular also wanted to know if you um, needed to permit through the Army Corps of Engineers for this work. Yes, we do, okay. we can, yes. Okay, great. Um, our next question comes from the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. Um, your um, figures showing the data were very clear. And can you say anything more about how you created the polar histogram plots? I think this might have been for the, the title direction. Um, what what program or software do you use? How was how how were the figures prepared? Well, I am going to defer that question to Joe Haxel. Uh, he actually prepared these. So if Joe, you want to answer that question now or maybe cover that um, in your next section, whatever you prefer. Yeah, I can answer now. It's just MATLAB scripts. You know, we wrote wrote some software to, to um, you know, we use a Nortec Echo um, ADCP and, you know, standard output and just have scripts that, um, you know, calculate the mean mean speed and direction over the deployment at those different uh, depth intervals and, and push those out into, uh, you know, canned uh, polar plot routines in MATLAB. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is from the Naval Surface Warfare Center. Are you exploring any strategies to make that MUD site usable in the future or do you plan to keep um, the current? Uh, location? Uh, that's a good question. I would say at this point, we aren't exploring further options. However, I will say that if somebody is really interested in that, that site or that type of substrate, uh, we would be more than happy to discuss with them what the interest is. Um, I, I mean, I use the term abandon the site, which might be a little bit strong, um, but uh, that was one of the lessons we learned the first year. Um, it, it really was quite a challenge for the divers. So um, it's not off the table. It's just on reserve right now. Okay, understood, thank you. At what depths below seabed were the items buried? Um, and, and if you could answer that for both sites, that would be great. Yeah, in all cases, uh, the items that are buried, they're buried just below the surface. So they're flush with the surface. And that really is for two reasons at this point. Um, you know, some of these targets are incredibly heavy, like the howitzer, and trying to bury them deeper than that by our divers is really a challenge. And the other reason at this point is that our, our current permit basically says, yes, you can bury targets, but they do need to bury, be buried flush with the surface. Um, so you know, they, this could be explored further, but that's, um, that's where they're buried right now. Okay. Um, next, we've received a couple of questions about um, if the targets are filled. Um, one of them came from Italy. Um, did you fill the UXO targets with any kind of compound like sand or resin or concrete to simulate the explosive charge that could be in there? Uh, the answer is, it's qualified, but the answer is no, the targets are not filled. Uh, we received <clears throat> all of our targets from either the Naval Research Lab or uh, Aberdeen Training Center. And uh, we use them um, as they come to us and we haven't done anything <clears throat> in addition to them. So in most cases, um, they are hollow and there may be holes in them. So they may be water filled when they're uh, placed on the bottom. Okay, thank you. Um, next, Dana, could you tell us more about the geophysical survey? Um, what was the survey process to get the coordinates and um, and what was the depth 
that was characterized? Um, okay, if you're talking about geophysical survey, you're probably talking about sediment characterization. <clears throat> I'm assuming and we've had several uh, surveys that have been done. Uh, there has been a multi-beam survey conducted um, by University of Washington Applied Physics Lab. Uh, we have also had some sediment um, density and porosity work done um, by Nina Stark. So it's, it's been a couple of um, types of surveys. It has not been necessarily comprehensive for the entire bay, but most of these surveys have covered that red permitted area. And um, the technique usually used for um, locating the site, if, especially on our vessel, is, has been a USBL system. Um, and Joe's going to speak to the geolocation aspect in the next section. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for the information. Um, next, uh, Dana, from the examples you've shown, it looks like the targets are placed and re retrieved in one field season. Do you ever leave targets out from one year to the next? Is that a possibility? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, to date, we haven't left the targets out between field season. And if there is a request to do so in the future, we would certainly entertain that and, and look at that. But there, again, are a couple of reasons that we only leave them out for one field season. You know, one is there is a greater risk of target movement or accidentally, uh, targets accidentally being snagged if they're tethered and pulled by a vessel. Um, and the second is under our current permits, um, we actually uh, stipulate that we will bring targets up uh, at the end of a field season. But I will say that we have not lost a single target yet in our four years of operation. So we feel pretty good about that. It's impressive. Okay, that makes sense. And um, Dana, we have one more question for you, and then we'll move on to the rest of the presentation. Um, you talked about the inert items that were placed. Was the smallest inert item, I think it was 40 millimeters, chosen based on any technology limitations, or is it possible to discriminate smaller targets than 40 millimeters? Yeah, you know, I am probably not the best person to answer that question. I, I, I will say that some of the technology demonstrators could, could give a better answer to that or the program office. But I will say that, that each year we work with the program office and they have conversations with the technology demonstrators to see um, you know, what they can reasonably detect, but maybe push the limit a little bit. Uh, so to give them a challenge. Um, and so to date, the, the smallest target that we have used is that 40 millimeter. Okay, thank you very much, Dana. And um, to our audience, feel free to continue to submit questions using the Q&A box. Thank you for all of the wonderful questions so far. And at this time, um, I'll turn it over to Joe to um, give the rest of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Um, so in the second half of our presentation today, I'm gonna move through some of the details of the test bed operations, including the target placement, ground truth data collection, and the work we've done around geolocation technology evaluation for uh, underwater objects in our Squim Bay demonstration site. One, one, one pass there. So, um, so starting with target placement, all of the UXO and clutter objects in the demonstration site are deployed by divers, as Dana mentioned, including both the calibration lines and the blind test areas. Objects must also be tethered under our current permitting requirements. Um, and the tethers are rigged from one eighth inch Amsteel Dyneema line 
Uh, they're spliced into low profile loops that fit in opportunistic grooves of the UXO projectiles. And this is shown in the, in the lower left there. Um, or around the sort of wasp end tails of, of other UXO projectiles as shown in the upper right picture. When there is no opportunistic attachment point to a UXO or replica, uh, we rig a small harness for the tether attachment um, that Dana showed in, 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 the, in uh, the earlier part of the presentation. Along the calibration lines, these tethers are, are connected with a plastic buckle at pre-measured distances along um, a 3 8 inch pot warp polyester baseline that runs the length of the calibration line. Um, and this baseline is shown in the upper left and lower right images. The calibration baseline is held to the sleeve to the sea floor with screw anchors on each end. And due to the often dark, low visibility conditions in the test bed, navigational aids are added to the calibration baseline in the form of rubber washers uh, to inform the divers of their position along the line. Examples of this are shown in the upper left and lower right pictures. So in little or no visibility, Divers can feel the number of rubber washers. In this case, there are four of them, um, and they know they are at the 40 meter mark along the calibration line. And using this rigging system and these navigational aids, the divers are able to deploy a pre designed layout of UXO and clutter objects in the test bed um, a couple of months prior to the performers arriving for their technology demonstrations and testing. Uh, moving on to the ground truth data. So ground truth data on placed object is, objects is, is really a critical component um, for the test bed uh, and is required for informing the developer testing as well as score demonstrations. The ground truth data is collected by the divers and reported to the surface vessel through, an, through our underwater acoustic communications. And when they arrive on, on site, um, they verify with the vessel the object type they're looking at and the relative location before beginning, be, beginning their measurements. The divers report the orientation of the placed objects to within 10 degrees using a magnetic compass. And they're careful to uh, hold the compass far enough above the metal surfaces to, uh, to avoid bias. Uh, UXO compass orientation is referenced to the pointed nose of the projectiles. Um, while other types of clutter, uh, with other types of clutter, uh, they use an easily identified characteristics um, like the flute side of an anchor or something to orient. The divers also measure the tilt of the objects to within five degrees using a held hand inclinometer that's shown here in the lower left. Um, and the divers report burial depth as simply proud, partially buried, or fully buried. And something to note, um, from the last presentation is uh, though our, our divers do, you know, hand bury um, some targets when they're placed, uh, a lot of these targets also self bury over the, the testing cycle. The last but argu arguably most important ground truth information that is collected is the geolocation position of the placed objects. So in the next several slides, um, I'll go through the different technologies and approaches we've used over the last several years for geolocation ground truthing in the test bed. So as I mentioned, we've made considerable efforts to evaluate several technology, geolocation technologies, uh, keeping accuracy, precision, and efficiency in mind. The geolocation data informs target placement, is critical for sensor technology evaluation and demonstration, and also aids in our recovery efforts. Beginning in, in 2019, uh, this series of drawings here shows the diver assisted methods that we trialed over the next three years. Um, on the left, a surface buoy, middle is an inverted long baseline acoustic system, and on the right, an ultra short baseline acoustic system. Not shown here, but will be discussed in, in a few of the later slides. Um, we also trialed a multi-range acoustic survey system 
that was nearly identical in hardware configuration um, as the USBL that's shown on the right. Uh, that included a vessel-mounted transceiver and a responder beacon on the seafloor. So going into, into more detail on each of these methods and technologies, um, the surface buoy was used in 2019 and 2020 and used a, GNS, a GNSS Rover antenna housed in a small buoy uh, that floats at the surface. During the first two years of using the system, the data were post-processed kinematic corrected using the NOAA CORS network base stations um, for improved positioning. The buoy is connected to a weighted line held near the bottom by a diver. And when the diver is positioned on the fiducial point of the target, they take up any slack in the line and then alert the supporting surface vessel that they are in position through the diver underwater communications. At that point, the surface support begins a two and a half minute countdown dwell on the target. The GPS system samples at one hertz. And at the end of the collection time period, uh, the surface vessel notifies the diver to proceed to the next target. At the depths used for the MUST and Ultratima demonstrations at 20 to 25 meters, uh, the bottom time for the divers is, is the limiting factor with this was one of the limiting factors with this method. And generally seven to eight targets could be surveyed per diver using this method for each dive. Um, and as you can see in the picture above here, during some surveys, we were able to run two data collection systems simultaneously. Um, but again, this method is limited to operational periods with low current and surface winds to help reduce the scope in the tether line that introduces positional errors. Uh, in, in 2020, we arranged a trial for a new commercial system using an inverted long baseline approach. Um, this acoustic system uses a spatially dispersed array of four GNNS, GNSS enabled surface buoys that transmit an acoustic signal every second to a diver held subsea navigation unit. And that's providing the divers their positioning in real time. This system was really attractive to us from an operations perspe perspective with the advantage of assisting the divers um, during their operations with underwater navigation, in addition to providing um, surveying capability for the target geolocation positions. The pictures show the small scale of the four yellow GNS GNSS surface acoustic buoys, um, and then there's a PNL diver on the right holding the subsea navigation unit. Unfortunately, after several attempts at in-water trials with this system, we had multiple hardware failures, um, and, it, and we determined that, that um, the system was not at a mature enough level for the application, um, and, and we returned it to the um, vendor for additional development. In 2020, a third type of underwater geolocation positioning system um, we trialed, uh, it was also an acoustic based unit. Um, we leased it an ultra short baseline tracking system that had a, a good track record um, in the oil and gas industry for underwater position tracking of divers and ROVs. The USBL system consists of a transceiver shown in the upper right picture with an internal compass, IMU, and small hydrophone array. Um, and then there's a, a responder beacon shown in the lower right picture. Um, and then also um, you have to integrate an external GPS unit to get the surface, give the surface position to the system. The transceiver was mounted on a pole below the keel of the vessel with measured offsets from the external GPS antenna. Um, the USBL system was configured to operate at a specific update rate um, where the transceiver interrogates the mini beacon responder that's held by the diver over the target fiducial point. The beacon replies at a predetermined turnaround time and the measured two-way travel time is used to determine the range to the target. Also based on the phase delay of the acoustic arrival from the beacon to the internal hydrophone array of the transceiver, an azimuth and pitch angle to the beacon are also calculated. 
The range, azimuth, and pitch angle are then combined with the offset to the surface GPS antenna position to produce an underwater three-dimensional geolocation estimate. So here are some of our uh, the results from the 2020 um, trials that we did with the system, comparing the target positions from two time offset GNSS surface buoy surveys along the calibration line, one in September and another one in October. And then the USBL system surveys um, were also performed in, in October. The upper panel, the surface buoy GNSS point clusters are shown in blue and red, and then the USBL um, points are shown in black. And you'll notice the larger variability in the USBL positions when compared with the surface buoy PPK GPS points. This is likely the result of no RTK correction um, being applied to the surface GPS unit uh, for the USBL system. Nevertheless, the mean positions and RMS errors for both methods are then shown in the lower panel and, and relatively good agreement in the mean locations uh, between the technology approaches uh, around the order of a meter. But, but looking at it, you can see that the, the RMS errors around the USBL system were significantly larger. So to better quantify these early differences that we were seeing between the technologies, distributions of the spatial offsets between the methods, um, and the different survey times is shown on the left. The spatial offsets between the target positions from the September and October surveys using the GPS surface buoy is shown in white. And then the difference in target locations between the US USBL and the two GPS surface buoy surveys is shown in black. Mean spatial differences are a little more than a meter for both approaches. Um, also with st similar standard deviation values of around 0.6 to 0.8 meters. On the right, distributions of the root mean square error for the USBL system are shown in black and the GPS surface buoy in white. Here we see a significant difference in the precision of the geolocation measurements between the two techniques with the USBL error around three times that of the GPS surface buoy. But again, this, this can mostly be attributed to the lack of an RTK GPS surface input for the USBL system. So in 2021, we added a local RTK GPS base station to our demonstration site operations. Um, the base station is set up over a registered NGS geodetic marker at the laboratory that has a clear line of sight to the permitted area um, and connecting base station and rover antennas via an RF link that provides around one to three centimeter horizontal accuracy out in the test bed. So now we're very interested to see how this important, this important improvement would impact our underwater geolocation accuracies. And in 2021, we trialed uh, two acoustic positioning systems with the new RTK GPS. One was a familiar USBL system shown on the left, the gaps, and then on the right a was the multi-range vector navigation system I mentioned earlier. The multi-range system uh, was is based on a least squares minimization of 50 or greater travel time based range estimates surrounding the target. Both systems are able to locate and track multiple beacons simultaneously. The main difference between them lies in the operational efficiency um, specific to our application. Positions for each target can be acquired within around 30 seconds with the USBL. Um, and then the divers can then swim onto the next object and cover a significant, significant amount of ground um, considering their limited bottom time. While surveying in a target with the VNAV system takes about 10 to 15 minutes for each target based on the slow vessel speeds and full azimuthal coverage. Um, and these surveys occur you know, after the divers have deployed the beacons, a set of beacons. Um, additionally, the VNAV system requires twice the diver effort. So um, the, the divers go out, set out a, a, 
a set of beacons um, in the target area. Um, then the vessel can come in, you know, at, as allowed and survey in those those beacons. Um, but then the divers have to come back, recover the the set of beacons, and then move on to the next set of objects. So it takes around about twice as much diver effort. So the, in 2021, our, the trial we set up um, used three screw, three screw anchors in a triangular configuration in the test bed shown in the upper left map there. The V-nav beacons were, the, were first lashed to the, each, each of the screw anchors and a series of four geolocation surveys were performed over a couple of weeks in varying environmental and tidal conditions. Following the VNAV system surveys, the, the VNAV beacons were swapped with the GAPS USBL beacons and a similar series of USBL system surveys were performed. Uh, the results from the four USBL GAPS survey trials are compared against each other in the lower left um, map. Uh, with colored RMS error ellipses surrounding mean positions for each survey date. Similarly, the VNAV survey locations from the four surveys is shown in the adjacent map to the right. The panel in the top right shows the zoomed in versions of each screw anchor location and the mean positions and error ellipses associated with each system. Dashed lines denote RMS error for VNAV and solid lines for the USBL. A one meter scale bar is in the upper left corner of the north box of the panel to show the lateral distance uh, between the systems, as well as the differences um, in the same system from survey to survey. So all these are occurring at, at submeter levels. Um, and based on similar perform the similar performance of these two systems, the real decision point for us uh, between them was in the significant gains in operational efficiency of the USBL over the VNAV system. So despite the lower upfront hardware costs, the VNAV system would be su substantially more expensive in the long run to use for our specific application due to at least a doubling of the, of the amount of diver effort that was required. So in, 20, in 2022, we acquired a GAPS USBL system and operationalized its use in the demonstration site for geolocation ground truthing. In the picture on the left-hand side, we see a diver holding the beacon above a UXO and moving into position for a 30-second data collection interval. The map on the right shows the geolocation positions from the USBL system along the cow line in 2022. And the panel below, it shows some examples of, of actual GAPS USBL returns from, indi from individual target acquisitions in red, and the mean positions from these are shown in black. So note the grid scale is at a half a meter, and the spread in each cluster of the data points falls within that 50 centimeter grid, grid spacing. The RMS error ellipses um, were on the order of 10 to 60 centimeters for the RTK GPS enabled USBL system in 2022, giving us uh, confidence in the submeter accuracy for all the geolocated targets in the testbed. So before summarizing, um, we'd like to acknowledge the efforts and outstanding work of our entire ESTCP PNNL team. It is uh, truly a team effort and takes a strong group of skilled staff to make the demonstration site in Squim Bay a success. And here's uh, some of our team, not all of our team shown here on one of our research vessels. So to summarize, um, currently permitted operations in the Squim Bay demonstration site include areas ranging from five to 30 meter depths in a variety of sand and mud bottom types. Divers are used to and, and carefully place objects in pre-designed target fields. They collect a suite of ground truth information as close as possible to performer testing and demonstration periods and also recover targets after, after the dem demonstration activities um, are completed. An RTK GPS enabled USBL system provides submeter geolocation accuracy for all the placed objects in the demonstration site. 
And then um, last, we want to mention, we're, we're really looking forward to future testing and demonstrations um, with program technology developers. Project benefits of the Squim Bay demonstration site to DOD include um, controlled field conditions in a semi-enclosed natural setting where technology demonstrators can test and validate their systems with inert and surrogate UXO munitions. Sensor technologies um, can be quantitatively compared in a well-characterized environment using a standardized approach that results in decre decreased programmatic costs. Um, and the demonstration site helps to advance technology readiness levels toward operational status. So if you'd like more information on what Dan and I have presented here, or the test bed in general, um, please visit the link shown here or contact Dana and I via email or by phone. So with that, uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Move on to the questions. Okay, great. And to our audience, you can um, continue to submit questions for Dana and Joe. And then um, after we ask some specific questions to Joe, um, we will move to some higher level questions, including one for Dave. Um, so first, Joe, you referenced self-burial, which could imply that the site isn't entirely sand. Can you talk to the variability of the sediment type within the blind test area? Yeah, the, there, is some, um, there is a gradient in the sediment type within the blind test area. Um, as you move sort of north, uh, from south to north, um, where the blind test area was set up and the you know has been set up in the past, the sediment um, transitions from sort of a more sandy sediment to a uh, more flocculent, um, fine, but sort of mud layer where where targets do actually sink uh, a lot easier than in the southern area. Okay, thanks, Joe. And as a follow up. Um... How deep do the UXO and clutter objects typically self-bury? Um, from what we've seen so far, they they're not going very deep. There's you know the ones that we haven't dug in um, that we see some self-burial. They may become partially buried or or su superficially buried. Um, we haven't seen one go you know too much too much beyond a centimeter or two below the surface. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you. Um, Joe, have you conducted any studies in high tidal areas that would document seasonal movement of underwater items? Um, we, we, I, you know, we haven't done that. Um, you know, our, we're, we're definitely a tidally influenced site um, and we pay quick, close attention to the, the tidal series, based on the, what activity or operation we're sort of doing. Um, as I mentioned with the, the surface buoy method for ground truthing and geolocation, we are very mindful to do that um, during periods of sort of slack tides um, or where there isn't a very high tidal exchange just to reduce the scope on the line. Um, and as Dana showed, you, know, you can kind of get a, a feel for what our change in depth in the test bed is um, with that mixed semi-diurnal tide. Um, Title range. Okay. Next, um, there's a question um, about potential challenges keeping the logs with the GPS surface float when divers are moving and spending 150 seconds on each UXO target. <clears throat> Do you have any tips on how um, you are keeping or synchronizing the logs? So our, we're, we're fortunate in that we have a really nice acoustic communication system with the divers from the surface. So the, the surface is really controlling the data logging period. Um, and we're relaying that start and stop time um, for the, the dwell with that buoy um, from the surface. So the, once the divers notify us that they're on the target, they have the scope of the line pulled in as tight as possible. Um, that surface initiates the logging and, and writes down those, you know, those logging times um, when we're using that method. The USBL system, um, we use the same sort of approach. Um, 
and you know the divers when they when they get down on the target they let us know um we're we're constantly tracking them with the usbl but we're only logging data time periods when um we have a, a feature within the software we can only log uh specific time periods so we'll let them know okay you know don't move and we ask them not to to um to, to talk over the, the communications link at that point um and then uh and then set up the 30 second um data collection period from the surface again so most of all of our data logging is controlled from the surface got it thanks so did you consider using a an, an rov a remotely operated vehicle instead of a diver for geolocation and this is specifically for for the usbl it's a, it's an interesting uh, an interesting approach. Uh, I think you know we have a uh, it is it's something that could be done. I think um, definitely, but I think that we have a good, our, you know, we utilize our dive team. They're ready and at hand and really skilled at it. So um, uh, that's what we've gone through with, with so far. We haven't haven't um, brought in an ROV, but I, you know, I think that's definitely a possibility that could be explored. Um, and and two or three more questions for you. Um, do you have challenges with encroachment, like from recreation or commercial fishing? Um, we heard, for example, that there was crabbing in the area. And if there are challenges, how is that? How are they managed? Um, this is a question from the Navy. Yeah, there that is a concern certainly that we have. Um, we've seen in the in in a few of the past you know past demonstration periods, uh, you know. The, the site is open to the public, so we can't close it off. People do come in um, and, and you know, set pots. We do our best to inform, um, for example, the tribal fisheries. We, we let them know what's happening ahead of time um, so that they're aware of what's going, what's going on so that they can share with their, their fishing fleets um, that there's active activities happening in, in the area. Um, but we can't control, you know, when they're going, when or where they're going to fish. Um, the the sport fishery, the state managed sport fishery, has um, it's a little easier to work around those because they post those those fisheries openers. So we have identified certain periods of being, you know, better times for demonstrators to come based on on those schedules. Okay, great. We have received several questions about the potential effect of weather or storm events on the studies. Um, I'm sure it's on all of our minds on the West Coast right now. And um, one of the questions was also in particular about horizontal movement of the targets. Um, so how does, how does weather affect your operations? Yeah, weather certainly affects our operations that we've seen. Um, Particularly because because we're all diver based, you know, there is some some level of safety factor. Um, our divers are a pretty hardy group and they can work in a lot of weather. But um, as far as ground truthing and geolocation, um, we try to target uh, calmer weather sort of conditions. Um, and we found that we get the best data that way. Um, movement of the vessel and, on a, and particularly of the surface GPS antenna. Um, can influence, you know, the 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 how good the data is that we are collecting. So, we definitely sort of try to work around better weather. Um, the USBL has opened up that weather window significantly compared to just using the surface buoy method, which was really restricted to very calm conditions. Um, okay. Uh, and then, as far as movement, lateral movement of UXO, um, we haven't seen anything natural movement that's been very significant um but we have seen some more recently some activity uh where potentially uh targets may have been um dragged by fishing activities or things like that so that is a concern okay thank you um one last question for you specifically joe um how did you determine the threshold or the objectives for positional accuracy for the items that were mapped? Um, was it based on system test requirements of the programs that were used or, um, or, or more of the challenges of actual location and remediation of underwater UXO? 
Yeah, we were, sh- I mean, we were, we were, you know, in discussion with the program office and as well as the technology developers, we're really trying to, do, you know, sort of do as best of state of the art as we could, you know, um, with that, with a reasonable cost associated with it. Um, and, and, and looking at it sort of from the commercial side. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of discussion was around, you know, can we get sub meter, you know? Um, and so initially we were, we were around a meter, a little bit over and with some improvements and, and digging a little deeper, um, we were able to sort of identify technology and, and an approach that where we, we could get sort of that sub meter accuracy level um, for ground truthing. That was sort of a target we set early on. Mm-hmm. Okay, understood. Thank you, Joe. And at this time, um, I'd like to invite Dr. Dave Bradley to um, come off mute. We have one question for you. Um, and Dave, the question is, what is the best way to collaborate or utilize um, this test bed that we've been hearing about today? Um, and what is the process? <clears throat> and then one more question, can it be used to support um, research activities via other agencies and programs other than CERTA and ESTCP. Uh, thanks, uh, Jennifer. I'll answer the last one first and because it's easier. Uh, the answer is yes, uh, in, in a very general sense. Uh, if, if, uh, if an agency has interest in, in testing in the Swim Bay area, uh, given the conditions and circumstances there, then, then uh, they would be more than welcome. Uh, the, the first part of the question uh, is not hard to answer particularly, but uh, the way I would, I would suggest is uh, if you're interested uh, a- as a potential user, then step one is to talk with the the PNNL people with the folks at Squim Bay first uh, to be very sure that you understand what can be done and what can't be done because they can answer that. Uh, after that, it's probably more of a collaborative thing, meaning if, if you feel that you're, you're getting a go ahead from Squim Bay, uh, then contact us uh, at the program office, and and w- what's going to happen? I can guarantee you is is a is a joint uh, combination of the PNNL folks, the program office, and you as the requester, uh, working with us to to get the job done. Over. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, I think we've lost your audio a little bit, um, but but I think we have the answer. Um, thanks very much. That was very useful. Um, we have a couple of questions to wrap up. Uh, Dana, I'll direct the first one to you, and then um, Joe wants to add anything he can. Dana, um, what do you think the biggest challenge has been in developing this underwater demonstration site? Thank you, Jennifer, that's a a good question. Um, I've thought about that a lot actually over the last few years. And I think um, in terms of actually developing the site, um, probably one of the biggest challenges has actually been permitting. It's it's just been, um, it's time consuming. Um, And because we're working with technologies that some of these agencies may not have seen and we're working with um, inert UXO, you know, there have been um, sort of extra um, concerns raised. However, I will say that we have been able to work through all of those challenges and, you know, we have been able to bring technology developers here for the last four years and, you know, part of the challenge with the permitting was COVID uh, because a lot of the permitting just slowed down. So uh, that, was, um, that was a little bit of a bump in the road as well. 
but I will say that the permitting is has gotten much easier, and um, we generally know what to expect now. If it's a technology that's been here, our process is much easier. If it's an, if it's a newer technology, then we have a better feel for um, how long it might take to get permits. Thank you, Dana. Um, Joe, anything you'd like to add to that? I'll add that another challenge was certainly the, the geolocation piece, right? That's something that we worked over the last several years on um, and, and feel that we've sort of landed on a, landed with some confidence on a good, on a good solution to that, so. Okay, thank you. Next, could you summarize um, what types of demonstrations you envision for the future? Um, Joe, we'll start with you. Uh, I think that we're we're starting to get some interest and and would like to um, move into maybe sh uh, shallower shallower areas. Um, looking at some of the shallow water technologies that are being developed um, within the program, um, so moving into you know the, the away from the the deeper 20 25 meter sort of um, environment into you know sort of five to ten meters or sub. Are, are even shallower than that. Um, that's one area um, that I think is, is of interest. Um, and I'll pass over to Dana for thoughts on other. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that, Joe. I think uh, we're actively searching for areas in the Bay that are shallower, that um, are not impacted or do not have eelgrass habitat. And, um, you know, they obviously would not be areas that are as large as what we've been working with, but um, we think there may be some areas um, with a smaller footprint that could be used in the future. Um, anything else? Yeah, I, was, I would also add that I think, you know, it would be exciting to see some, maybe some autonomous systems. Um, come to, to test in the bay because because it's a controlled and fairly quiescent bay and area. Um, you know we have pretty high confidence that that you know uh, if there's there's issues with with the robotics that you know they can be recovered pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Well, Dana and Joe, I'd like to thank you for the very clear, interesting presentations and for answering all of the questions today. Um, we'll wrap up at this time, our next webinar um, for the Startup and ESCCP webinar program is on Thursday, January 26th, and that webinar will feature DOD funded research efforts to develop modeling and monitoring tools that evaluate passive and active remediation approaches for sites that are impacted by non aqueous based liquids. You can visit the CERTIP and ESTCP webinar webpage to register for this and the other webinars through the end of the next year. Before we conclude, I want to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation from today will be archived on the webinar webpage in case you want to refer to them in the future. And we would appreciate it if you could please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at this time. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you.